Support for Ben Franklin's World comes from the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture. In July 2015, the Omohundro Institute inaugurated a new program, the Scholars Workshop. Each summer, the OI invites six untenured or unaffiliated scholars to Williamsburg to work with its experienced editorial team on improving a book chapter or journal article. The goal of the workshop is to help scholars write better, more engaging history books and articles. Whitney Martinko, who's an assistant professor of history at Villanova University, participated in the first scholars workshop. I asked her about her experiences and she revealed this. It's not an exaggeration to say that the scholars workshop at the Alejandro Institute has been the most intellectually productive two weeks of my career so far. I submitted a chapter, the first chapter of my dissertation that I was looking to turn into a book chapter. And when I got to the Alejandro Institute, I realized that I had fallen into a trap that I think is pretty common for young scholars, which is that the first chapter tends to set out a sort of a broad overview of the book rather than just getting into chapters. Chapter one and starting the book. So I realized that it would be a better strategy and more convincing to my readers and more entertaining as well to dive right into a particular story. So I really came to hone in on story of how Anglo-American settlers who are coming into the Ohio Valley treat Native American earthworks. They set out to preserve what they call Indian mounds in their cities, particularly in Marietta, Ohio. So the lesson that I learned was that sometimes to tell the big story, you have to focus on a specific spot, a particular time, tell the specific story to make that bigger picture clear. I think that the book that is coming out of this workshop is one that is much more dynamic, has many more characters, sets readers on the ground in a much more compelling way by bringing us young scholars together. The Amahundro Institute created a community that then produces more dynamic conference panels that produce better books because they're in conversation with one another, that produce more engaging classes as well because there's a richer scholarly exchange among us all. The Amahundro really is a scholarly setting that the benefits of it diffuse into museum exhibits, into books, into conversations on your podcast even, so that that dynamic community that they create and that they support really does reach into public venues as well as scholarly settings or scholarly books. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Kovar. Hello, and welcome to episode 97 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. Throughout the Doing History series, we've been exploring different aspects of how historians work, how they find topics to research, how they research those topics, and how they read different historical sources for information. What do historians do with all of the information they find when they research? How do they organize their research in a way that allows them to find the information they need to write the books and articles we enjoy reading? In this eighth episode of our Doing History, How Historians Work series, Billy Smith, a professor of history at Montana State University, joins us to explore how historians organize and access their research. During our exploration, Billy reveals information about his research into the lives of 70,000 people who lived in Philadelphia during the late 18th century, how he collected, organized, and accesses his research about those early Philadelphians, and how historians' research organizational methods have changed over the last 30 years. Are you ready to discover the answer to one of your most pressing questions about how historians work? Let's go meet our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, Here is this week's special guest. Our guest is a professor of history at Montana State University. He's the co-author of three books and the author of four, including, most recently, Ship of Death, The Voyage That Changed the Atlantic World. He is the co-creator of the Mapping Historic Philadelphia Digital Project and the forthcoming digital project, Fleeing Slavery, Freedom, Negotiation, Defiance, and Desperation. Both of those projects rely on thousands of records, which is why he joins us for our Doing History, How Historians Work series to investigate how historians organize their research. 
Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Billy Smith. Thank you very much, Liz. And it's good to talk to the most famous person I know who has the most followers of any historian I know. Thanks for having me. Billy, you crack me up because we met just this past May. And every time we've met and corresponded since, you greet me as the most famous historian you know. And I'm never really sure what to say to you. Except, in all seriousness, if I've acquired any fame, it's because I talk to amazing historians like yourself. You all have such great information about early American history to share, and great histories of interest to a lot of people. So let us now get into your information about early American history. In the world of history, Billy is what we call a quantitative historian. Billy, would you tell us what a quantitative historian is and tell us how you became one? Quantitative historian, uh, not too many of us are doing that anymore since it really started to emerge in the early 1970s for a couple of different reasons. One is, as people shifted their gaze, that is, scholars, to lower class people, African Americans, women, people who didn't leave a lot of written records. And one of the ways you could get at those people to understand them, both then and now, is to investigate the records where they are recorded and to try and piece together than their lives. What that entails usually then is finding records where they're recorded, censuses, tax lists, city directories, items like that, or maybe if they come into contact with the almshouse or things of that sort. So I and other people have taken those kinds of records and quantified them and used those statistical data as at least one aspect of our interpretation of the lives of especially lower class people in the past. A lot of your work centers on colonial Philadelphia. Why is that? Is it because you started with Philadelphia and now have too much data from all the censuses, tax lists, and city directories to study a different city? It's true that I keep returning to Philadelphia again and again, although I've done a number of other books about the Atlantic world and things of that sort. But part of it is exactly right, that once you spend hours and hours and days entering records into a computer, as I did way back in the 1970s, beginning then. It's advantageous to stay with that kind of material and to build on it. And so one of the reasons I do go back to Philadelphia is because of that. And I can keep augmenting the data I have, which I've done for the last 30 years. And it's one of the reasons I have so much data available to me now. Secondly, also, originally I got interested in Philadelphia because as I was interested in lower class people in the revolutionary era, this was one of the more radical places. This was one of the places where you had the most obvious class conflict, too. And that's what originally drew me there because that's what I was interested in, especially in my first book, about the circumstances, conditions of lower class people and how do they participate or not participate in the revolutionary era. You went through all of these different types of records, census reports, city directories, tax lists. What kinds of information were you collecting from those sources? And what did you do with all of the data once you found it? Well, I collect a whole host of information. As I look at the records, I try to figure out, before I even start entering any data or hiring people to answer data, I try to figure out the kinds of questions I want to ask that might be answerable by looking at this kind of data. Another part of it, though, is also to see what the data itself will reveal, and therefore, should it get recorded. And generally, what I've found over the years is the big mistake I made early on was not recording all the data I could. I would make selections of recording just a couple of things, for example, from the tax list. But as I've aged and maybe become wiser or at least more experienced, I have found that you want to put all the data in that you can at one time because it's surprising how many pieces of information that you didn't think would be worthwhile are worthwhile ultimately and that you can ask questions once you get it all together that you had not thought of to begin with. So if you want a few more details, I can tell you about the kind of data sets I've got. Yeah, that would be great because we'd love to know, like, when you're looking at, say, a city directory, what types of information would we find in that type of source? And what knowledge about early Philadelphia would we be able to glean from that information we find? City directories were in early America, just beginning in the uh, 1780s, really, the late 1780s. And in Philadelphia, and it's one of the reasons I also returned to Philadelphia, because it's got such a rich trove of records. In the late 1780s and then throughout the 1790s, publishers began to put together these city directories. What it has in there is the name of the head of the household, that person's address, and also that person's occupation. 
So those are three columns, if you want to think of it, you would put in a data set. You'd have a name, you would have the address, and you'd have the occupation. Now, you can add to that by using other records that are still extant from Philadelphia, which I've done. 1790, for example, and 1800, the first two censuses, have a lot more kinds of detail about not just the head of the household, but the composition of the household, the race of the householder, the occupation, things of that sort. So I've recorded all of those things, too. And then the tax list has different kind of information, occupation, but also how much taxes do people pay? What kind of taxable property do they have? Do they have slaves and servants? Because those are taxable, for example. And then you create a data set out of that. And then the hardest part is mushing all of those together to give you an incredibly rich data set with a whole host of variables. Probably I've ended up with, I guess, 20 different columns of information on each household head from, you know, family composition to occupation. So what can we do with all of this data? Perhaps you could tell us about your Mapping Historic Philadelphia project and show us how you use the data you've collected. Yes, it's a project that I started along with Paul Sivitz, who is a PhD student of mine about a decade ago, and we're both still working on it together. It's never been our major project, but it's sort of a secondary project for us. And what we thought we would do and set out to do basically was map anything we could find in Philadelphia. Now, mostly that's people. But we could map the city and all the information we had about the individuals who lived there and see what kinds of information that would give us. So we focused on 1790 and also on 1800 as the two end dates, but we've done a few city directories in between. So we get some sense of change over time as well. But again, what we've done then with the help of a lot of undergraduate and graduate students, we've been able to amass a tremendous amount of data of 50,000, 70,000 people, something like that, that then we can look at various slices of Philadelphia during the 1790s. 70,000 Philadelphians? Billy, When you placed all of their data on a map, what interesting insights did it reveal about early Republic Philadelphia? I've been doing several papers out of that. Once again, Paul Sivitz and I have been doing some papers out of that. Our most recent one was with the Omohundro Conference this summer. And what we were focused on and really spurred on by what's happening in our current world in America, we were spurred on to look at how did people organize themselves by ethnicity or did they organize themselves by ethnicity? And so part of our mapping finding was that in ethnic terms, Philadelphia in the 1790s was very well integrated. Nothing like Philadelphia is today, quite frankly. It's one of the more segregated cities in the world right now, especially with an African-American population that's quite segregated from the white suburbs and things of that sort. Very typical of lots of American cities today. But in the 1790s, people are living side by side. You've got Germans living with Irish next door, even on the floor above them. You've got some French people who are in there living side by side with Scots and Scots Irish. So to us, and one of the ways we interpret that, is that this kind of interaction was absolutely necessary in your daily life. You couldn't walk down the street. You couldn't go to a shop without seeing people of different ethnic groups. In addition, and, you know, it depends on how we define African-Americans as a separate race or as a separate ethnic group, African-Americans are pretty well integrated, at least in residential terms, into the society. That doesn't mean, of course, that they're accepted as equals because they surely aren't. But this interaction of people going to a shop, if you're a Scots person or of Scots heritage, but you go into a shop that a German owns. Now, surely there must be some hostile interaction on occasion, but searching through newspapers and looking at newspaper reports that we can search keywords, that doesn't seem to be a lot of the issues in Philadelphia in the 1790s. Instead, people seem to be, at least on the surface, able to live with one another. And again, to go back to the you know, current world in America, we see this as an early era of the early new nation that's emphasizing city of brotherly love that's emphasizing the way in which people from a whole variety of cultures can actually coexist and perhaps even learn to tolerate one another and perhaps even take the next step and learn to respect each other. You have collected, as we said, demographic details for around 70,000 Philadelphians. How have you kept all this information straight? How do you organize all of your research? 
That's what the job of the data sets is, mostly. And that is, I use Excel. It's a very easy program, really, to put in a little time and to learn. And also, it's a shareable program. I share a lot of my data, and I'm committed to doing that. And since lots of people use Excel, just like lots of people use Word, it's an easy program to send to other people to post online, which Paul and I have done, so that other people can use that data. But essentially what it is, if you don't know what an Excel file is, is essentially a variety of columns. Then you put information in each column. So again, I think as I mentioned, I probably have about 20 columns on every person in Philadelphia who we can find in one of the records in any case with a whole variety of information. Then you can use Excel or some other kind of program like maybe Statistical Package for the Social Science, a real old program that I used to use. But you can use Excel or SPSS to analyze and produce statistics and graphs and all kinds of fancy ways to visually be able able to see what that data means, be able to interpret it. You mentioned that you used to use software called Statistical Package for the Social Sciences. Billy, you've been a historian for over 30 years, and I have to imagine that your research organizational methods have changed a lot over time. Would you tell us how you used to organize your research? Like when you wrote your dissertation in the late 70s, early 80s? <laughs> And tell us how you came to use Excel today. You're really going for the old stuff here, right? I used an old-fashioned typewriter. I know. It's just amazing, isn't it? Which also meant then whenever you got corrections from your committee, you had to go back and type the whole thing over again, too. So I was just physically doing a lot of typing. Fortunately, I got really good at it. But, you know, it was the old days. There weren't computers around, or at least desktop computers, where you could, you know, type your material in and then edit it and things of that sort. So just in terms of writing old-fashioned typewriter kind of stuff, which I'm really glad I don't do anymore. Text editing has been fabulous for that. But in terms of doing the research itself, for example, my first book, dissertation, I was doing what was then traditional, which is five by eight cards, where you would put a heading at the top, and then you would make a note, either on a secondary or primary source, of a particular topic, and then you would end up with, you know, four shoeboxes worth of these five by eight cards. Very cumbersome, very difficult system. And I quickly moved away from that because of the cumbersomeness and went more and more to notebooks. I would have notebooks on individual topics and I would change notebooks that I would hand write in about particular topics or a particular chapter that I knew I was going to work on or an essay or something like that. The great joy of when the computers came in and especially where we are today with them is now, of course, I put all my notes, just type them into the computer, whether I'm in the archives or if I'm reading a book and keep them in separate files. And then what I found has just been wonderful the last half dozen years is to be able to use Office to search for keywords in those files. Because I can't even remember exactly what's in those files many times, regardless of what title I've given those files. But I can do keyword searches. And my memory is pretty good, and especially when I know what I'm searching for, to be able to structure a few keyword searches. And, you know, they just pop up in seven files. You go open those, and voila, hopefully you've got some good material. You know, you said I was going for the old ways. But I know historians who still use and swear by the note card method. In fact, during my first year in graduate school in the early 2000s, my advisor sat me down and gave me the note card method talk. I tried it out, but then I was like, what am I doing? I found note cards were really cumbersome, and that system just doesn't work for me. Yes, and I still know. In fact, David Large, good friend of mine up here, who writes about a book every other year, he's just amazing. And he still handwrites. He's just said that he's always liked that system. And I do recall handwriting, too, and liking that. And he likes the, you know, the flow of it. And so he still handwrites before he ever types anything in. So, you know, clearly, whatever works for people, it seems like, whether you're writing, whether you're researching, whatever system one can develop that works for one, well, that's probably the best system, quite frankly. You've given us a broad overview of how you organize your research, and I'd like to get into the nitty gritty of your present day practice of it. But before we dive in, would you tell us about your present project, Fleeing Slavery, so we have a bit of context to go by? Thank you for asking about both of these projects. Another thing that I've discovered about myself over the last 25, 30 years is that if I'm working on two projects at the same time, it really helps me a lot. I don't think it speaks well to my sense of focus because I get bored relatively easily with one project. So I'll work on it for three or four days. And then rather than just stop and not do anything for a while, I move to the other project. And that renews my interest usually. I also find that working on two projects at the same time almost always 
one informs the other because I'm thinking about two different topics and even if they're separate, like, for example, the Runaway Slaves Project, which is my major project right now, even if that's separate from the mapping Philadelphia, I do find that there are overlaps between the two. So the Runaway Slave Project, what I'm trying to do there, and Simon Newman, who's at the University of Glasgow, he and I are applying for various grants to fund our trying to put together information about runaway slaves across the Atlantic world. So everywhere from Africa to British North America with the Caribbean in between, he's got a big project going right now on Scotland and Britain and runaway slaves there has found a surprising number. And so what we're trying to do is think in broader terms. And so we can have comparisons between the various areas, understand then what are the goals and strategies of runaway slaves themselves, how successful can they be in those goals and strategies, things of that sort. And as we're doing this, what we're primarily focusing on, but it's not the only thing, are advertisements for runaway slaves. Now, most people might know something about this because they've become more popular among historians over the last 10 or 15 years. And what they are is that if you own a slave, George Washington, for example, and your slave runs away, you put an advertisement in the newspaper saying that you'll give a reward for whoever captures this runaway slave. And in that process, you give as detailed of a description as you can about the runaway slave. So what it means is we have tens of thousands of these kinds of advertisements and that we can dig into those to try and understand the slaves themselves. It's a great teaching tool, too, is what I found. When I give these to my undergraduates or graduate students, it's great to just give them three or four of these, have them read them, think about what kinds of information they might be able to garner out of this. And also it leads naturally into saying, well, but who produced these things? And what kind of biases might there be? And of course, it's all produced by white people, by owners with lots of prejudices and biases. But it introduces the topic, too, about reading primary sources in the past. How do we try and evaluate them? And how can we read against the grain, which probably a lot of people who listen to your podcast know about, and that is that you're reading one kind of document written for one reason, but that you can use a lot of that information to interpret different kinds of people. More specifically, of course, in this instance, you've got the owners writing these descriptions, but it reveals a lot about slave life if you can read carefully and against the grain. In an effort to fulfill his goal of collecting around 2,000 runaway newspaper ads for fleeing slavery, Billy just completed a research trip to the American Antiquarian Society in Worcester, Massachusetts. Billy, would you tell us about the newspapers you looked at and what you did when you found information within them that you needed for fleeing slavery? First, the American Antiquarian Society is just a fabulous place to work. I've worked there off and on over the decades. One of the things that's is so glorious in the reading room that it always makes me feel like a scholar, whether or not I truly am a scholar. I mean, it has that kind of feel about it. a couple of other places that I really enjoy that feels like that is a Library Company of Philadelphia, Benjamin Franklin's original library, and also the Library of Congress, where you're sitting in this you know massive institution with famous paintings all around you and busts and things of that sort. And it's like, I must be a scholar because here I am. And I really enjoy that part of it. The American Antiquarian Society itself, of course, has virtually every printed document in early America, including just about every newspaper that was published in early America. Now, they've computerized a lot of those, and that's made it enormously easier to do research in them. First, because I don't have to travel back to the Antiquarian Society. I can just sit in my office and do it. But secondly, also, you can can just do keyword computerized searches again, too, and turn up these advertisements much faster than I did 30, 35 years ago or 25 years ago. When you sit in front of the newspaper, and while it's always great to have an 18th century document in front of me, and you turn the pages and you keep looking for, you know, runaway slave ads on each page, which is quite tedious and takes some time, even though I still just love doing research, too. So if I come across those kinds of documents, I will record a whole variety of things 
things. What's the name of the slave? What's the date the advertisement's put in? Who is the master? What's the occupation that the master's talking about the slave? You know, masters will often describe them as mulattoes, perhaps, or light-skinned. What kind of African scars might some of them have? Where might they be going? There's probably 20, 25 different kinds of pieces of information that I record from each one of these runaway slave advertisements. And what do you do with the 20 to 25 pieces of information that you find in a slave ad? Are you recording them in your Excel spreadsheet? Precisely. Yep. So you set up sort of codes for all of this, or you're sitting there in front of your Excel and you can punch all of this in. Do you ever take digital photos of the records you find so that when you're back home in Montana, you can reference them? I know that's become very, very popular. It's not something that really I have done very much. When I first started going to archives, you could make some microfilm of some of the pages that you would come across, or you could get them to scan them in in some way or another. I didn't find that too useful because I would do it too much, and I would scan a whole bunch of things in, and I would come back home, and then I'd just be kind of overwhelmed by it, quite frankly. What instead I've done over my career is when I go into the archives, archives, I try to dig in right there and start figuring out what is the information they've got, what's the most important thing that I can have, and also rather than just passively record it, try and interact with the documents themselves and see where they will lead me often. And so that I found that a much more successful strategy for me is, even though it's slower and it takes longer time to acquire the material, I see archival time as not just gathering information, but also interacting with that information, asking questions, seeing where it might lead me while I'm still in the archives to other kinds of sources. When you're reading a runaway slave ad, do you ever transcribe the ad verbatim into Word or into one of your Excel data sets? You know, about 25 years ago, I published a book with about 300 advertisements, both for slaves and also for indentured servants, runaway advertisements with the University of Pennsylvania. And in there, that's all they are. I mean, I've got some analysis to at the beginning introduction, but that's specifically what they are, typed in verbatim from the advertisements themselves. The notion was that, again, as I mentioned earlier, I find these to be incredible sources to help undergraduates and graduate students understand what historical research and interpretation is all about. So yes, I've had a great deal of experience in the past just verbatim typing everything right in. Nowadays, I don't do that as much because, again, you can revisit on the computer any of these advertisements if there's a specific person. So I might take a few notes in addition to entering data into the Excel file. And if I want to go back and look at the ad, that's really easy to do once I'm on my home computer here. Okay, but say you did want to transcribe these ads today. Would you save your transcriptions in Excel or would you store them using some other electronic or paper method? Right. No, I just use Word, simple Word system. And if I type them in, to the extent I type them in, I just save them within those Word documents, essentially. And then, of course, they're searchable too, you know, by name or something of that sort. But no, I don't do anything fancy with that. Just put them in a common Word file and keep that. Bethany would like to know whether you use any other data management systems. We've talked about Word, we've talked about Excel, but do you also use software like Zotero or FileMaker Pro, Scrivener or DevonThink? You know, I haven't, quite frankly. FileMaker Pro I've got, I've looked at, looks like it probably would be uh, quite useful, but now I've found that I can do the statistical analysis I need to do with Excel, pretty much, and also just the writing and keeping of notes by doing Word. So I keep it pretty simple in that regard. And frankly, also, I'm just tired of learning new <laughs> new systems, new software. So that shows how long and old I've become. And so I'd much rather now just put my time into thinking about history, writing about history, than getting too fancy with these new programs. But I'm sure that they would save people a great deal of time and, and help people organize their work. You raise a good point in that technology is great, but it's also kind of problematic in that it changes so fast. When I started my dissertation, I chose to organize my information in Zotero, which is a free open source piece of bibliographic software. The software's primary function is to create proper citations, but I found that I could use its note, tag, and keyword search features to attach all my research to my citations. Over time, I put so much information into Zotero, the software became too clunky to search. So then I started using a new program, DevonThink, 
which is designed to be a research database, so that was a plus. And it's a great piece of software, but it took time for me to learn all the features I wanted. Plus, since there was no easy way to transfer my research from Zotero into DevonThink, I now have research for my book project stored in two and three different places. Yes, yes. And I know exactly what you mean by that. Having, you know, used data for a long time, and I've had to keep translating my data from one kind of platform to another as things have changed. You know, I even had floppy disks in the old days. Well, before that, actually, I had data files on IBM tapes, those big ones there that you only see in movies nowadays from, you know, late 1960s, early 1970s. And then, you know, as they started to go out, I had to get a programmer to help me to get them off of there, put on to new computer systems. And I think we had floppy disks at that point. I've had to keep upgrading as we go along to try and keep the data compatible and usable. And fortunately, I've been able to do that. It's one of the reasons why I can go back 30 years to data, because I've managed to think, okay, well, I should keep updating or I'm just not going to be able to use this anymore. Do you know if there's a preferred method for keeping our digital research files current and accessible? You know, so that 30 years from now, we can go back and access their data. I don't know exactly preferred method, but let me talk a little bit about a project that I've worked on with Andy Shockett that we're still working on. And that is what we have set up is a repository for data sets for early America. The notion is that there's lots of people who've created lots of data in early America and done it by hand, and it's taken thousands of hours to do it. And that if people can preserve their data and feel good about that, that will be preserved, that a route to go. Also, what we're trying to do here with this program or with this website is to let anybody who wants to use that data make it available to them. You know, it's just anybody who wants to sign on to the site. You don't have to have an affiliation with any institution or anything of that sort. And you can use the data that people mount there. The website is called Mead, which Andy came up with, which stands for the Magazine of Early American Data Set. So Mead, it's affiliated with the University of Pennsylvania, the McNeil Center for Early American Studies, which is one of the two great centers in the world, along with the Omohundro, of course, for early America and early American studies. So if you just sign into the McNeil Center and you will see on their opening page, actually, the Mead site. We've been soliciting lots of people and lots of people have sent data sets in. What we also did was work with the University of Pennsylvania Library who really are experts in what's the best possibility of keeping this data so that we'll be able to use it in 10 years, 20 years, and 30 years. Somebody else will be able to use it. So the University of Pennsylvania librarians know a lot about this, obviously. And we have with our interactions with them and trusting them so that if people put their data sets on Mead, not only will it be preserved or have the best chance of being preserved in perpetuity, and also it's a way to really, you know, share things in a scholarly sense, which I think is really in many ways at the heart of our profession, because I've been very fortunate in having people for decades share information with me, share data with me. And I've tried to turn around and do exactly the same thing. This is a really great reminder that just because we digitize our information doesn't mean that our information is permanent. We still have to find time to take care of and maintain it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And quite frankly, without having it mounted somewhere, unless you're going to really be upgrading it every four years, five years, it's probably going to end up relatively quickly that you just won't be able to use it, even if you wanted to go back to it yourself. In addition to creating the digital projects that rely on the large data sets we've been talking about, Billy also writes books and articles. Billy, does the way you organize your research for a book or article project differ from the way you organize your information for a digital project? Yes. And I guess I've talked a little bit about how I keep my notes now, both for primary and secondary sources, in Word files. And so if I go to uh, particular archives, like the American Antiquarian Society, for example, I will just set up a Word file and just take my notes right in there. Or if I read a book, I will take a separate file on that book. So what I end up with are hundreds of files, quite frankly. And again, I depend on the sort of indexing and computer word searches to find the material material that I need. And then the next step often is, okay, then I will take various files for a particular chapter, let's say, and I will, you know, set up a folder for 
chapter one, whatever that's going to be. And then keyword searches, find the files that seem to be relevant to the topic, and then I will copy them into the chapter one. So that kind of narrows down to, you know, maybe 40 files that I've got in there that I can relatively easily work with. When I'm writing, I open up two screens, basically. One with the notes on one of the screen are various note files, and the other is the screen that I'm, I'm doing my writing on. Do you keep the information you collect from primary sources separate from the information you gather from secondary sources? It kind of sounds like you do. Pretty much I do. Yes, that's right. Because when I'm doing archival work or if I'm doing primary source work on my computer here, yes, I'll have separate files for them. We've talked a lot about the different ways you organize your research, but it seems like research organizational methods really vary by person. And that's because historians think, write, and outline their research in a lot of different ways. Yes. Do you know of any other ways that historians organize their research that it might be helpful for us to know about? A bit, or at least I'll make one reference on this, and that is a good friend of mine, Simon Middleton, who's at the University of Sheffield. He and I were talking about this last year, I think it was, and he was saying that what he's moved to is verbal note-taking, basically. So, you know, as we all know, you can set up your computer and you can talk to it and it will just record your words. Well, he's found that's very useful, so that when he's reading a primary source, let's say, he has an idea about it, or if he just wants to, you know, read a specific quote in to it. He just reads it into the computer rather than typing. And then, you know, he's got all this in the computer. He can do the same kind of computer keyword searches that we do. He can open up files. He's one of the ones that suggested to me this way, you know, open up your various research files on one screen and then write on another screen so that you've got it right in front of you, shift back and forth very quickly. I think that's interesting, but I'm a really good typist, frankly, after all these years. And so I haven't really moved to that kind of verbal note taking or even writing an essay, he was talking about how he's starting to even write in that fashion and talk it through, which I think is quite admirable. And I'm sure a lot of people that would work very well for them. And on that note, let's move into the time warp. Normally, this is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. However, I've gone ahead and brought our time machine out of the garage so Billy can use it to travel into the future. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. Technology changes quickly, as do the things that we can do with it. Billy, in your opinion, how will historians conduct research and organize their information in the future? In my own lifetime, as I've been talking about here over the last 30, 35 years, things have changed so radically. I think one of the most significant things for historians and scholars is that, and I think this is a sad occurrence, is that we probably will not go to specific archives anymore in the future. We won't need to. And I'm just drawing on my own recent experience with my Ship of Death book uh, that came out a year or two ago. I started that book off and on seven, eight years ago, traveled really from, you know, to Paris to London, to the Antiquarian Society, to LA, and to half a dozen other archives to do research on that. By the time I finished that book, I could find almost anything I had looked at online. It had been scanned in online. Now, that was fabulous because I could go back and look at it. On the other hand, because I love working in archives, I love doing research like that. And frankly, I love going to Paris and London. But I see that as being less and less frequent or dependent on as we move into the future. And, you know, I can just almost get anything I need right now on my computer. Now, things do change. It's true. And much more information is available and will be available in the future, clearly. I also assume that, you know, in just trying to project, but I don't know where technology is going, except that it's going to become more and more all-encompassing in our lives as well as in our research lives. But I assume we will just be talking to computers and asking them to fetch things and asking them to find things in a much more sophisticated fashion than we're able to do even at this point. And that's how a lot of our interaction and doing research is in many ways going to be done by computers. As long as we can frame the questions correctly and as the computers move along and get smarter and smarter as they seem to be doing. A lot of historians are very concerned with this idea that we won't need to go into archives anymore. Do you think historians will lose anything by not going into physical archives and looking at physical sources? Yes, 
I think they'll lose things both looking at the physical documents, which, again, I have just fell in love with when I first started holding 18th century documents. And there is something special about that. There's something I always find inspiring about that, just having the document in my hand. And it is much different in many ways than looking on a computer screen. But other things I found about archives that are so valuable is the community of scholars that one finds there. I've almost always had great experience in going to archives if I spend, you know, two or three weeks in meeting people, meeting the staff who have just tremendous knowledge often of the records they've got and have helped me find things that I never would have located before. And also meeting other scholars who are working there, going out to lunch, talking about their projects and making friends through that. And so I found that a very social occasion in many ways and not just in, you know, getting friends, but also in interacting in scholarly fashion about, well, what project are you working on? And, you know, what information do you know about this? And being inspired on how other people are working too. So those kinds of aspects I fear will disappear. I don't know if they necessarily have to if people make a big effort to talk to each other through computers and Skype and things of that sort. And I'm hoping that that might be a way out of this kind of dilemma of how do you keep conversations going with other scholars. And certainly email has made that much easier to do too. But that physical presence of the documents themselves, other humans, that's something I've cherished as I've done work in archives. And one of the reasons I like going there and yes, it will be too bad when that disappears. We've heard about your two digital projects, Mapping Historic Philadelphia and Fleeing Slavery. Are you working on anything in addition to those projects at the moment? No, I'm working on basically a couple of articles out of each project right now. As I said, I just did something on ethnicity in Philadelphia. And I've just recently written an essay about runaway slaves in early America, too. So right now, I don't have a specific book planned out. I'm sure I'll probably get there at some point, probably on each project, a book. But right now, I'm just thinking in smaller terms and trying to figure out the kinds of questions I really ultimately want to ask in a book. And so working on articles is a way for me to generate those kinds of ideas and to see a little more clearly then at some point after I've written a couple of articles, ah, this is where I truly want to go with a book. Billy, where is the best place to look for more information about you, your digital projects, and how we can contact you if we still have questions about how to organize our research? Paul Sivitz and I have for this mapping project a website called Mapping Historic Philadelphia that you can find online. It's free, open, lots of information there. You can use any maps or you can use all of the data that we've got there. Mead, as I mentioned, this magazine of early American data sets has some of my material on there, but lots of other people. I'd say we've got maybe 20 other scholars at this point who've contributed. And if anybody wants to contribute, by the way, you should check it out, share your information keep it in perpetuity. It takes probably, you know, half an hour to load your data onto there and then it will be around. And then finally, I have a personal website. It's just connected through the history department here at Montana State University. I'm also very happy to email with people. I share lots of data with people and anybody who contacts me just about in return, they probably get much more information than they ever hoped they would. Billy Smith, thank you for taking us through your digital projects and for revealing how you organize your research. And thank you very much, too. I appreciate it. Goodbye, and be good to your horse. Historians organize their research in many different ways. As Billy noted, he likes to keep things simple. He collects information he needs for his data sets in an Excel spreadsheet. He collects information he needs to analyze and interpret that data in Microsoft Word files. And anytime he needs to find information to write or create his visual models, he performs a keyword search. I don't know about you, but I was really surprised by the simplicity of Billy's organizational methods. I really thought a tech-savvy historian like him would be using software like Zotero, Evernote, DevonThink, or FileMaker Pro. You know, a method that speaks more to our present-day tech-rich world. With that said, I really understand and appreciate why Billy likes to keep things simple. Learning and incorporating any type of research organizational method into your workflow takes time. That's time you can't spend researching, writing, or podcasting about history. By taking the time to learn and become proficient with one organizational method, and by sticking with that one method over time, you can actually focus on doing your research rather than on how you store it. Whatever organizational method you choose, you should consider how long that method will allow you to access the information you put into it. As Billy reminds us, 
digital data needs to be accessed and updated every four years or so, or we lose our ability to access it. And although we didn't spend too much time talking about collecting and organizing research by paper methods, those of us who like to keep our information on handwritten note cards or in handwritten notebooks probably need to think about a proper backup system for our paper-based data too. Most of us never count on a home or office break-in or damage from a natural disaster, but we put so much time and energy into collecting our information, we should develop some sort of system to protect it. You can find information about Billy, his digital projects, plus notes for the software, apps, and resources we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 097. Also on the show notes page or in your Ben Franklin's World app, you'll find a link to a handy dandy reference sheet I created with the help of about 20 historians. This sheet offers short descriptions of how each of these historians organizes their research and information about how you can contact them if you have questions about their organizational methods. Just like us, the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture enjoys and appreciates great and engaging history books and articles. That's why they're always looking to find ways to help scholars produce them. The OI has a lot of great programs, just like the Scholars Workshop, that help historians do history and do it well. And this benefits all history lovers, because as Whitney noted, the work OI-supported scholars perform inform not just the books and articles we love to read, they also inform the museum exhibits, digital projects, and podcasts we love to visit, use, and listen to. For more information about the Scholars Workshop, and all the different ways the Omohundro Institute supports early American history, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash OI. Finally, how do you organize your research? I'd love to know because, as I mentioned, my method is a bit of a mess right now. So please, send me your awesome tips, tricks, and methods to liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweet them to me at Liz Covart, or post them in a comment on the show notes page or in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.